All right, welcome. This is the second uh, lecture for Microprocessors 1. Uh, this lecture is for the 27th of August. Um, let me just do a couple things. First, uh, let me just go over the, uh, the syllabus real quickly. Uh, I'll shrink this down and we'll bring up the syllabus. So if we scroll down to the schedule, which is really what I wanted to do, which is I think down here someplace. Okay, so you can see the 27th, um, we, we're, we're, we're going to do the prerequisite test. I will hopefully have that prerequisite test posted by late tomorrow, uh, for sure by Friday. Uh, I have not had time to convert it from a written form to an online form, but I will get that done. Um, and I also have to do it for two other classes, so that's that's the problem. Um, this Friday, and I, I sent out an email. The first email I sent out a correction right after the first one because I I said tomorrow, but it's not tomorrow. It's Friday. Uh, so let me just say that again. Not on Thursday, but on Friday, we will have all the materials on campus uh, that we have ready. I have everything except I don't have quite enough two line by sixteen displays, and uh, but I have plenty more on order, and I don't have I don't I only have a handful of snaps. Snaps are coming. Uh, I'm working with microchip to get a big discount. If we just bought them as is, they cost us $24 a piece, plus shipping and tax. Uh, we could maybe avoid the tax, but anyway. Uh, but uh, microchip will either give us a big discount or give us some free, and so we'll work that in and we'll wind up with a much lower cost. I'm, shooting, I'm hoping that they won't cost any more than about $10. That's the idea. We'll see. Uh, that's what we did them for uh, the last couple of semesters. Um, so that's where I am. Um, and we don't really need them till the boards are all put together. So the earliest we would need them is, is a week from this Friday. And hopefully w we may miss that window, but we'll have some programmers in the lab. Uh, I have a bunch of Picket 3s, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll see if we can make that work. Uh, don't panic. We will we'll definitely uh, get the snaps. Even if microchip doesn't come through, I'll just order them uh, myself. I'll pay $24 and I'll still sell them to you guys for $10 and we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, but in any event, uh, uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, had been working at uh, their university rep, uh, had cancer and was really sick. And so he's kind of been kind of out of the picture for a little bit. But now he's uh, doing great and he's back on back in the saddle. So so I'm hopeful this will all happen. Uh, he did promise him, he promised him within a couple of weeks. So hopefully uh, we'll know. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, so again, prereq test hopefully will get done here soon. Um, and it'll be an online test. Uh, just do it, uh, do the best you can. It it's only it's, it shouldn't take you very long. And not only that, but it's uh, it doesn't count for anything as far as you're concerned. It, it's only for ABET purposes. It helps me kind of know, uh, in theory, what things I need to cover that you maybe should know but don't know. Um, okay, this lab for this Saturday, this Friday, is just to get your uh, your your Viva board uh, constructed, and actually, it's uh, it's revision 4.4 is what it is. Um, so not 4.2. Okay, so anyway, so that is the skinny. Um, so today I'm going to pick up, let's see, uh, oh, so I also today will do a little solder demonstration. I'll do that at the end. First I'm going to, I'm going to lecture for maybe 40 minutes uh, on the, uh, uh, on the standard things I want to get covered. And then, uh, and then I'll stop and I'll set up and continue the the video with a little little quick demonstration of uh, some solder techniques. You can definitely go on the line and see some videos. There's plenty on YouTube, uh, but hope but I'll show you kind of what I do, and um, and then we will we will have several solder stations in the lab to, on Friday, uh, and uh, we should have five or six or maybe seven something like that, and hopefully we'll we'll have. Uh, 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 several, maybe a TA and a student or two and myself 
to just kind of give you pointers and help you get this done. Um, it should take you maybe 25, 30, 40 minutes to solder one of these up, or maybe even less than that. Uh, so uh, I think even if you're just taking a long time, it shouldn't take more than about an hour. Okay, so that's, um, that's where we are. All right, let me go ahead and pick up where we left off on Tuesday. And here we are. Let me bring back my little video. Oops, uh, let's bring it down. Okay, yeah, there we go. All right, so we're going to build the pick board. We're going to use it for 10 labs. Uh, we're going to have some homework, and uh, we'll do a, we may, hopefully we'll be able to do the practicum with the pick board. We'll see. We'll do a, you'll do a, a, a course project with the pick board. The projects will be either a, a team of one, two, or three students, and that's it. Uh, no teams of more than three. Uh, we, I don't know if we're going to do the KL25Z labs at the end. We may, we may not do those just because uh, it's such a logistical headache with uh, to get everything set up when we're you know when nobody's around. Um, okay, and then uh, we will have we'll have um, we'll have at least two tests and a final. We'll see. Uh, I've typically done three in a final. The tests tend not to count for so much. What really counts is completing your 10 labs and your project. All right, so everybody has to make their pick board. Uh, do not borrow one from a student from a previous semester. I can tell if you did your board for this semester or if you have a borrowed one. Uh, we, and, and when we do the uh, practicum, uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Uh, you will need to have your own personal board. Um, we will use quite a few different ones of the peripheral modules that are part of this chip that's on the board. The chip is the KO, uh, is the PIC 16F 1829. It has a lot of capability and a lot of peripheral modules, and we'll use we'll use many of them. Uh, we won't probably use them all, but we'll use a lot of them. We will program it in assembler for the first few labs, and then we'll switch to C. Um, and we'll do the rest of the labs pretty much in C or C++. For purposes of the code we're going to write for this, it's basically not much distinction. Um, we, the reason we're going to look, we're going to use the, uh, the uh, assembly language for the PIC is because I want you to see what an instruction set for a microprocessor looks like. And although every you know, every family of microprocessors has sort of a different uh, set of assembly language instructions. If you've learned one, it really pretty much teaches you what you need to know to learn others. So it is definitely the case that there's tremendous benefit from doing this once. Secondly, when you learn assembly language, you, you essentially wind up knowing how your microprocessor does its work. You, you know actually how it works because you pretty much have to learn that to learn the assembly language. And so that's another very powerful reason why you ought to know this. Now, if you were computer science majors, I probably wouldn't make you do this, but you're electrical engineers and some of you are going to be involved in building microprocessors and you need to have, have used one down to the level of detail that includes its native instruction set. Uh, and not only that, but even if you never write another line of assembler code, which certainly might be the case, being able to write assembly code and knowing how it works informs you about how the C code is actually executed. Because how, how does the C code run on your processor? The first thing it does, it's compiled into assembler. And then the assembler is then assembled and loaded into the into the microprocessor to run. So what's actually running in the microprocessor is always the native instruction set. And uh, and you should see how that process works. And the other thing is uh, not so much when you use an IBM mainframe or a desktop or a laptop or whatever. You Rarely then would you ever need to write assembly language code. But on a microprocessor there are times when you actually have to write uh, some small pieces of your code, perhaps in assembly language, for various reasons. But sometimes you need to get down in the weeds to get the maximum speed possible um, to deconflict things, and uh, and sometimes uh, it's just a way to make the hardware 
uh, work more accurately and efficiently. Uh, for instance, on this chip, uh, well, on chips in this family, not so much this chip, they have switched from the touch touch button module, which is on this chip, the, the capacitive touch sensing module, uh, which we will use. They've switched on uh, chips in the same family that are uh, a little bit newer, uh, and they're no longer putting, they're no longer including the uh, the capacitive touch module in any any of their newer chips in this family, because uh, although it works pretty well, there they, it has a fatal flaw, and there's some there's a problem with it. And what they've done instead, they they use a uh, a computing analog to digital conversion module uh, that they then uh, that they then use assembly language library routines to uh, to do the touch sensing. So uh, so in order to do touch sensing, you actually have to run these assembly language uh, 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 library routines. Uh, and if you're going to also use your um, A to D for other things, then you need to be able to switch it back and forth from running the touch buttons to uh, to uh, doing your analog to digital uh, uh, conversions for some analog values you're you're trying to use. Uh, so you you really need to know some assembler in order to take advantage of the features of a microprocessor. And and even though uh, most of your code will probably be written in C. Uh, in the future, still knowing knowing at least on one microprocessor, having programmed in assembly, having learned assembly for one processor, uh, puts you in a great position to understand what you're doing in other situations. And should you need to, you could uh, you could you would feel comfortable uh, getting into the native instruction set for those chips as well. And um, so so I just throw that out there. Uh, that's what we're going to do. And 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 and. Um, you're going to do fine with that. It's not, it's not that difficult. Um, okay, and like I said, I, I don't know about the KL25Z. If if we if it seems like the course is running efficiently and we don't have people going crazy in every direction, not getting their work done, then we'll try and get that done. Uh, we did not do that in the spring because we barely got done what we should have gotten done uh, with just the KL, with just the pick. Uh, but if we can, we'll do the KL25Z. And uh, so that is a, it's a it's a 32-bit processor. It's it's an ARM zero core. It's a little it's a little different. Um, and uh, and we buy the board already pre-made. And it, it is a uh, uh, it's a seventeen dollar board. I usually sell them to you guys for fifteen and just take the loss. Uh, and I I'll, I'll buy some, but I, I may need to get reimbursed before I do that for uh, for the ones for the fall. So anyway, we'll see. Okay, um, I think that's it. All right. Okay, so um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to touch a few things that you'll hear about. Uh, so uh, so one of the very first computers was an ENIAC. Um, the, all the early computers through probably the mid '60s were vacuum tube based computers. Uh, the first computer I used definitely had vacuum tubes and and took a lot of power. Uh, only had 2K of memory. It was it was core memory, um, and uh, they persisted into the 70s. The transistor was invented in 48, but they didn't really get used in computers for a while, uh, and because uh, uh, well they were expensive, and I guess there were a lot of issues with them. Anyway, you should know about uh, um, yeah the, the the dynamic random access memory came out in about 72. And that's when that's when we really started using memories for computers. Now, uh, the most microprocessors sold today do not have dynamic RAM on them. Uh, in fact, dynamic RAM is usually sold separately, and it's 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 uh, hosted on a motherboard, and it requires some support circuitry to make it work because dynamic RAM must be must must be refreshed very very frequently. I forget. I don't know how every every maybe every millisecond or so you have to you have to refresh it by addressing I think uh, all the rows I don't know I, I've never written uh, a I've never written a, a board to support dynamic RAM it's kinda challenging to do and it's something you'd only do if you really had to uh, static RAM is what is hosted on almost all microprocessors and the static RAM is also what's on 
uh, what's what's the level the cache uh, level one two and three caches on uh, on you know on our Intel and AMD chips um, but the dynamic RAM is what So the dynamic RAM is what's uh, that's what's on the little sticks that get plugged into motherboards, and like I say, they, they require a fair amount of support to make them work properly. Moore's law. You need to know about Moore's law. You probably have heard of it. Uh, Moore basically, um, uh, and I forget what year he proposed this, but he basically said that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles about every one and a half to two years. Um, I think initially he said every one year and then it's kind of slowed a little bit, but about every two years we're still doubling the number of transistors. I think we're about ready to run uh, out of uh, physics for this to happen on silicon. Uh, of course, people have been predicting the death of Moore's Law for a long time and it's, and it's continued. So, uh, so who knows? Uh, but uh, we, definitely, uh, we definitely have seen this, this trend, this doubling almost every initially every year, every then year and a half, now pretty much every two years or maybe a little more. Um, but now we're down to seven nanometer technology. Uh, there's maybe two labs in the world that can do that or two foundries in the world that can do seven nanometer and or maybe maybe a few more. The latest AMD and Intel chips are in fact uh, uh, seven nanometer technology. But a uh, silicon atom in the matrix is maybe about, uh, about a, a, a 0.3 uh, nanometers. So at seven nanometers, you're talking about 21 atoms across the features. So we're we're really getting down to where I don't I don't know how much further you can go. Um, and obviously, size is driven by feature size. So, uh, but here we are at seven. Pretty amazing. I I still can't believe we can do 10. Uh, in fact, anything under 100 is shocking. Okay. Um, so some of the very first uh, uh, there were a number of early computers. I'm not going to go through the whole history. As far as sort of, you know, little computers that you could buy, the tr the, the Radio Shack, TRS-80, the Apple II, the Commodore PET were some of the early ones. And then in 81, IBM came out with its PC and the operating system, they contracted with Bill Gates to write it. That's uh, where Gates uh, got his start to make his billions. Um, and uh, IBM did not... Uh, insist on having the rights to the operating system. They let Gates keep them, which then allowed him to create Microsoft and start selling operating systems to every computer that was made, uh, at least every IBM PC. Pretty amazing. Okay, um, so these are core memories. And this is what I used uh, on my first computer, an IBM 1620 that had 2K of core memory. And these are little ferrite rings with hole in the middle. and uh, they have one, two, uh, three, I think they have four wires through every one is the deal. And, and uh, some of the wires, so what, what they do when you run a current through, uh, through one of the wires, it, it, uh, I guess it polarizes them, and then you can, then you can sense them with, uh, uh, you can sense the polarization, uh, by using a couple of the wires that run through them. And, uh, and that way, if it's polarized clockwise, it's a zero and counterclockwise, it's a one or vice versa. And, uh, and you can see here, this is kind of how it does it. There's a, there's a, a set of vertical wires, set of horizontal wires, and then there's one that weaves its way through, which is called the sense inhibit line. Uh, and basically they're destructive readouts. So Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess there are only three wires through each one. I don't know. I'm having a little trouble figuring this out for sure, but um, but uh, but the uh, so anyway, when you do read out the polarization, you erase it, and so you have to re you have to rewrite it once you read it. Uh, these things are, I don't know how fast they are, uh, but in in. They certainly uh, aren't as fast as uh, solid-state memory, but they—I guess—they were pretty quick. But probably the support circuitry was what took the time. 
And this is what it looked like. Here's a plug-in core. You can see all the connectors on this edge. And underneath uh, this, this plexiglass window are uh, all the little cores. And I can't remember how much this is. This might have been 1K of memory here, uh, something like that. Uh, this was super expensive. This, this thing was probably $1,000 or more. And these had to be done by hand. These little wires had to be threaded through by hand. Really amazing. Um, here's another picture, a closer up, close up of the same thing. And you, you can imagine somebody doing this by hand. Um, but that's what happened. Uh, and that's how we did the, uh, that, that's how these things were done. So amazing, huh? Now, here's a, Here's some core memory down here, and sitting on top of this core memory is a uh, SD card that's eight gigabytes. This, this, these cores, you can count them. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in each row, and there's eight in a column. So this is an eight by eight matrix of bits. So if you take one row as a byte, that's this. This is eight bytes. So here you have taking up way less space is 8 billion bytes sitting on top of 8 bytes. So you can see uh, that's another major reason why we don't use core anymore is just a sheer size thing. And remember, for every foot of wire, uh, that, that costs you a nanosecond a time. Every foot of wire is a nanosecond, roughly. Uh, okay, here's the, uh, here is the, uh, the Radio Shack Trash 80 here, TRS-80 called it oh uh, no I'm sorry that's the pet here's this is the Radio Shack Trash 80 uh, well this is the pet uh, this is I this may be a this may be a, an upgrade of this uh, of this Trash 80 in the early days we used cassette recorders uh, to record the data and then later they came out with floppy disks this is an Apple II this is what I did my PhD thesis on I built a card to plug into this computer that, and this used a 6502 chip, and I, I built a card with another 6502 and 2K of additional memory, and I plugged it in, uh, and we, uh, um, and then I used I interfaced it to an ultrasonic scanner, a Doppler scanner that was used to look at carotid arteries, and I used this to generate images on the screen of the of a three dimensional image of the carotid artery. That was the idea, anyway. All right. Enough of this. Um, okay, I'm just I'm going to speed along. But um, the very first chip in a car was a 6802, which ran the trip computer, uh, which really didn't do much. Uh, probably wouldn't be able to run your windshield wipers today or adjust your mirrors. Uh, so, and that was in 1978. Your average car now probably has 40 or 50 micros, and they're all uh, they're all in the same uh, they're all in the same network. They all talk to each other. The the 1960 Apollo guidance computer and the Miniman 2 guidance computers, um, they, they they were made of just uh, pretty much discrete components, and uh, I don't know what they did for the processor, but uh, in those days, a, a, a little discrete um, quad NAND gate uh, was about $1,000, and because these came along, they pushed that price down to about $3. Now, they're, they're, they're actually a little bit pricey because they're just... You know they're going out of style, and so uh, I don't know if they're making that many of them anymore. But uh, they still they'll cost you maybe uh, fifty cents now. Uh, of course, you can get billions of them on a transistor on a major integrated circuit. All right. So, um, so what's the difference between a microcomputer and a microprocessor? So I'm gonna well. So here is a microcomputer, and it sits on a motherboard that looks like this with a big fancy cooling fan, and uh, it has memory cards plugged in here. It has some uh, bus cards plugged in here, a graphics card plugged in one of these somewhere. Uh, you may not have a whole lot of other things plugged in, uh, but you definitely have some memory plugged in here, and that's your dynamic RAM. And then over here you have your USB ports and uh, your, your your sound jacks and your Ethernet port and whatever else it supports. Um, and then you have some dedicated chips here and here that are just used to uh, to manage all the stuff on the board. 
uh, the, the PCI bus and the memory. Okay, and there's your, your processor. So the actual processor, it has, some, it has some cache on it, but it doesn't have large amounts of memory. That resides on these cards on the motherboard. And it doesn't have, it doesn't have a bunch of I.O. pins driving peripheral modules to talk to the real world. All that's on these plug-in cards. And then uh, here's an example of a, of a microprocessor, probably something like an 80-pin one, 20 pins to the side. And uh, it would maybe run a robot like this. The difference is this one has, uh, this one has read-only memory on it in, on, inside the chip itself, whereas this one doesn't. The, there is read-only mem read memory on the board here. Uh, I don't know. It's somewhere. One of these little chips would be a little ROM. And that ROM would have enough code to get this whole system up and working and then to be able to start up the disk drive and, or the solid state drive and bring in the operating system from that. Um, whereas this one has all the code already programmed into its EEPROM. It's, it's usually flash memory, it's ROM. And then it has a little bit of RAM for processing things, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a few K or 10 K, usually not a whole lot more than that. But it has a whole bunch of built-in peripheral modules. It doesn't, however, have uh, typically the circuits to drive a monitor. It typically doesn't have, uh, uh, you know, inputs for USB. It might support USB, but you, you'll have to provide some off-chip support to make that work. And, uh, and, and so things like keyboard and mice, you normally won't use with this. That You'll have a program. It will run at May Control. Uh, the wheels, the servo, it may control some guidance uh, sensors, it may, uh, it may have a GPS unit, and who knows what all. There's all sorts of things that might be uh, included that this chip will, will use, and a lot, of, a lot of those features will be built into this chip. So here, you have to have an entirely supportive motherboard just to make the chip work. Here, the chip has all that stuff built into it. And... Uh, and maybe a few extra chips thrown in, like a GPS receiver and that sort of thing, but not too much else. No monitor, no keyboard, no mouse. Here you have displays and keyboard, keyboard and a mouse. So that's really the big difference. We will call these microcontrollers, our embedded processors. We'll call these microcomputers. Okay, uh, so mostly the microprocessors are Intel, AMD, ARM, a few others. Um, but the microcontrollers, there are a lot of them out there. Here's a small list of some of the ones that are actually uh, uh, making these chips. And many of them now have gone to using strictly ARM cores. So they make all the peripheral devices, and then they lease from ARM uh, the actual core uh, Verilog code, and they marry those up, and then they generate all the stuff to go to the foundry and to make the chips. So ARM doesn't make any chips. They just lease. They just lease Verilog files, and these companies then make make all the chips. and And the list is bigger than this. It's just a little list. There are tons of companies you, I've never heard of, and you've never heard of, that make lots of micro uh, microcontrollers as well. Uh, some of these are combining. Microchip bought Atmel a couple years ago. Uh, Freescale uh, was bought by NXP a few years ago, and then and then. Um, uh, uh, Qualcomm was trying to buy them. I don't even have Qualcomm on here, but they're certainly on here too. Um, so there's a bunch. All right. So a micro a microprocessor is just a VLSI chip that contains the CPU, some memory, some uh, some some read-only memory, some static RAM, and a whole bunch of modules to get stuff done, like A to D modules, uh, uh, timers, uh, PWM modules. Uh, D to A modules, uh, uh, touch sensing modules, all sorts of stuff. A microcomputer doesn't have any of that stuff. It's just got some cache, and that's it. And it needs a whole uh, motherboard to support it so that it can uh, do what it does. And so really, microprocessor, microcontroller, kind of interchangeable. Um, yeah, here's a list of a few more. There's Qualcomm. There's a whole bunch of them. And and uh, it is shocking, but even uh, there, I, I, there may not be a single microprocessor company now. There's certainly not many that don't use ARM cores. 
Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the programmer's module. Now, uh, this is uh, this is the the PIC 16 L uh, 1829. I'm sorry, F 1829. There's also an LF chip, which is just a low power chip. That's what the L stands for. I don't know what the F stands for, but the L is low power. And uh, and so our chip is can run at uh, from uh, I don't know. Just a little over one volt, 1.2, maybe, I don't know, one point something, up to 5.5 volts. The LF can't run uh, over three and a half volts. So, uh, so we're using the five volt part, uh, but it can run over a wide range of voltages. Your board has two voltage regulators on it, one that regulates the 3.3 and one to five. So you can run your chip at either of those voltages, depending on if you're interfacing something to it. You may want to pick the voltage that the that the device that you're interfacing runs on. Uh, sometimes those interfaces are permissive, and you can run at different voltages. You can run your chip at five and the peripheral at 3.3. Sometimes vice versa, but sometimes you can't. So it's it's good to have that flexibility. Um, this is the chip on the Freedom Board. It's a KL25Z128. It's an ARM core made originally by Freescale and now by NXP. Uh, it has 80 pins. It's it's and and the both of these now are service mount chips. The difference is that Freescale didn't make any through-hole parts at all. There weren't; they have none. So uh, you have to buy it. Uh, you have to do a service mount chip. So it's more of a professional thing. The Pick World, you can still buy a lot of these parts in through holes, and that's something more like what a hobbyist will use. Although I think more and more we're going to see all parts going to service mount exclusively. But Pick's been one of the last ones to go that way. Atmel too. Uh, but then they bought Atmel. So um, this is a relatively low pin count because it's uh, 20. This is 80. So this has four times the number of pins. Um, you can get these parts with more pins, um, but that's the that's what this chip is. Um, we you could you can do an awful lot with 20 pins, but um, anyway. They uh, both of these are very similar. Um, this has uh, this has 49 assembly language instructions. This one has 56. Uh, this is Harvard architecture, and this is von Neumann architecture. Those are the two fundamentally different architectures for microprocessors and microcomputers. Really, um, the the von Neumann architecture on the KL25Z means that everything's in the same ex address space. The Harvard architecture means we have two different address spaces, one for our program and one for uh, all of our data and our peripheral modules and whatnot. And, um, and uh, so on this chip, we have two separate data buses and two separate address buses. One, one set only deals with memory and the other set only, uh, or, or only deals with program memory, which is typically the flash read-only memory. And the other set deal with our uh, our random access memory and all of our peripheral modules. Both of these chips do what's called memory mapping. Memory mapping is where you include all the peripheral uh, stuff in the, in the same address space as your memory, uh, and you use the same instructions to access it all. Uh, this is what almost all modern processors do. But believe it or not, the chip in your laptop or the chip on your desktop is not memory mapped. Uh, it has it has uh, separate I.O. instructions for your input output and that's all because uh, we're still using the same legacy IA32 instruction set that uh, that really came into being with the original um, 8080 or 8008 uh, microprocessors that Intel made. So so we're really we're really dragging um, his you know uh, legacy uh, instruction sets down through years and years of, of very fancy chips, uh, but they're still using these really antiquated instruction sets. They've had to expand them in order to get, let the memories grow into the gigabyte range, but um, uh, with paging and other things. But we're still really we're still really bound up in these in this original IA32 instruction set for our, our Intel and AMD chips. Pretty amazing, actually. Um, okay. Um, the, uh, one more thing. So this KL25 has uh, 
16K of static RAM, and 128K of program flash. This, our, the chip you're going to use uh, for most of the stuff this semester uh, has 1K of RAM and 8K of program flash. Uh, but um, it can store a little, it, every, every location, the 8K can store an instruction, whereas here uh, uh, you, need, um, you need two of the locations for uh, every instruction, and some, some instructions you need uh, four of the locations. So they're not quite as, it's not quite as dense. Um, and then this one has this funny little thing. It has a 256-byte EEPROM. It's not flash. It's electrically, uh, it's like flash, but it, it's a little different technology which allows you to erase individual locations and rewrite them. And this is, a, this is where you can store data on your, on your, on your PIC that is non-volatile. In other words, if you turn your PIC off, everything in your memory goes away. Everything in the flash read-only memory stays, but that's usually just the program and some constants. But if you collect some data and you want to save it, as long as it's not more than 256 bytes, you can put it in this EEPROM, and it will. It, you can write this uh, during runtime when you're when the computer's running, and then if it powers down, that data is preserved, and you can you can read it back out. And that's not a feature you'll see on like this KL25Z, for instance. Um, so it can be very useful. Um, if you wanted to do that with the KL25Z, you'd have to add an external component to do that. Uh, all right. For the PIC, we're gonna we're gonna use uh, we're gonna use the data sheet. And so all you have to do is type in PIC 16F 1829 data sheet uh, into your browser, and it'll go get the data sheet, and you can read it as a PDF. Uh, the KL25Z is a little more complicated. Uh, you'll have a little harder time getting the data sheet. And the reason for that is uh, because the ARM core is made by ARM, so the data sheet for the ARM core uh, comes from ARM. And the data sheet for all the peripheral stuff and how it's hooked up together comes from uh, NXP. So you have to get some stuff from NXP, some stuff from ARM. And unfortunately, uh, the stuff from ARM doesn't know what NXP implemented or didn't. So they're just telling you everything, but some of the features are not available. So you have to you have to cross-reference it with the NXP data sheet, and uh, this chip is this chip is more complicated, and the data sheets are much less readable, uh, and you will pull your hair out uh, trying to really uh, get to the same level of expertise with the KL25Z as as you are with the PIC. Uh, all right. Let's talk about, uh, I think I'm going to not talk about the KL25Z model right now. I'm just going to talk about the PIC. So here, here is the programmer's model for the chip you're going to use, the PIC 16F1829. Uh, the programmer's model is basically a term that was coined, uh, wasn't, wasn't a, a term that I knew back when I did my PhD thesis, uh, but it is a term that's been introduced in the last maybe 20 years that describes how you as a programmer or you as a user of this chip interact with it. And, uh, and so these are all the critical, uh, critical registers that you have to deal with to uh, get instructions executed, essentially. Now, on our chip, it's a, very, it's a fairly simple chip. And that's one of the reasons why we use it in this course. Uh, if you start on the KL25Z, it, you're, it's, it's more complicated and your head would hurt more than it will with this chip. But this chip, ha because it's an 8-bit processor, uh, they do have to play some games that actually makes it a little more confusing. So there's no perfect starting computer. But anyway, here we are. So we have one working register. Now, since it's an 8-bit computer, how many bits do you think this register is? Well, it's 8 bits. Surprise, surprise. Um, and uh, we, we have... Uh, so all, everything this chip does, almost, everything this chip does, almost, has to use this register. So this register gets a workout. And all it is, it's just eight uh, flip-flops. That's what it is. Eight flip-flops, and I'm sure they made them as high speed as they possibly could. And, uh, and, uh, and they're, they're just used extensively. Um, and I'm sure they have 
clears and sets on them, maybe. I don't know, but probably. Anyway, this then we have an I we have a what's called a, a blank select register here. I'll come back to that in just a second. We also the next register we have is a program counter. Now you remember that this this is a a, a Harvard machine. So it has a separate area for data memory and a separate area for program memory. The program memory is all flash. The data memory is made up of, of a bunch of things. The data memory has static RAM, 1K's worth, uh, you know, 1, 1K, 1,000 uh, and 24 bytes. The, uh, the program memory has 8K. But interestingly, the program memory is not 8 bits wide, it's 14 bits wide. So every every uh, word in the program memory is 14 bits. Every word in the data memory is 8 bits. So they are totally different sizes. So the so the so the uh, so the data bus going to the data memory is 8 bits wide, but the data bus going to and from the program memory is 14 bits wide. The program memory has uh, up to 32k of address of addresses. Now on this chip, it's only got 8k used, but it has the capability for 32k. And some members of this family do have that much uh, program uh, memory. All the program memory is flash on this chip as well. When when you when you so the program what the program counter does, and you will find a program counter on every single microprocessor or computer, as far as I know, that's ever been built. Uh, and what the program counter does, it holds the address of the next instruction to be executed. So the program counter is used to address the program memory, and the, the CPU goes out and gets the program, the instruction stored at that location in program memory. In this, in this chip, all the instructions fit in a single address. Uh, there, there are no multiple address instructions. But in many microprocessors, the instruction set's set up so that uh, an instruction can be, uh, you know, maybe 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits. Uh, it can be multiple bytes long. Uh, the the KL25Z can uh, has some, most of its instructions are 16 bits, but some are 32 bits. On this chip, all instructions are 14 bits, every single one. There is no instruction that's not 14 bits, and uh, so they're all 14 bits. So every single address is an instruction. And, and so what happens is uh, there, there'll be address in, program, in the program counter where the program starts. When it starts working, the CPU hardware goes out, gets that instruction, all 14 bits of it, and brings it in to an instruction decode register, which is not part of the programmer's model because we as programmers don't have any access directly to that at all. That's a hardware register strictly used by the hardware itself. And then it decodes that instruction and uh, and does whatever that instruction says to do. Add, add the W register with a memory location or move a memory location to the W register or move the W register to a memory location or any of a bunch of other things. Now, because, uh, because we have a maximum of 32K of addresses in our program memory, guess how many bits the program counter is? And it turns out 2 to the 15th is 32K, so it has 15 bits. Uh, so the way this register is broken up, though, is kind of interesting. We have a 8-bit processor here. And we have a 15-bit register. So how do we make that work when we can only move eight bits around at a time? And the answer is we have sort of this special feature. We have we have uh, a we have this program counter divided into two parts. One the the lower eight bits, which we call the program counter low (PCL), and then there's a separate uh, seven-bit register called the program counter latch high, PC lat high, PC latch. And that PC latch high is only seven bits. And what it does is you, when you want to write a 15-bit address in the program counter, 
you have to do it all at once or otherwise the next instruction would would only take the part you wrote with the old part that you hadn't written yet and go get the wrong instruction so so remember whenever you rewrite this register you're you're essentially branching uh, you're changing where the program counter is pointing next and normally we don't do this but but uh, we have instructions that will do this for us but if you do it manually by you know by hand in rare cases you might have to do that if you're making a very large jump uh, in the program memory anyway the way you do it is you first load the program counter latch high with the upper seven bits of the address which doesn't change the program counter because the upper seven bits of the actual program counter uh, are uh, we can't directly write to them well all we can do is write to this latch and then we write the lower in the next instruction we write the lower eight bits in the program counter low and when we write the program counter low it always automatically takes whatever's been preloaded and hopefully you did preload something into the program counter latch high and puts it in to the program counter upper seven bits at the same time that it writes the lower eight bits so that's how we get around writing a 15-bit register in once with an 8-bit microprocessor we really have we let the hardware take care of a preloaded latch and dump that in the upper seven bits all right in addition to uh, the W register and the program counter and the bank select register which we're going to come back and talk about in a second we have we have uh, we have a status register and I'll talk about that next and then we also have these two file select registers FSR 0 and FSR 1 which are both divided into an upper FSR 0 low and FSR 1 low and a hot upper FSR 0H and FSR 1H registers so these are 16-bit registers and they're they again we only have an 8-bit processor so we can't write all 16 bits at once so what we do is we can write the lower 8 bits on one write using the FSR XL and then we can write the upper bits using FSR like if we're writing FSR 0 we'd write FSR 0 L first or maybe second whatever and then we would write FSR 0 H next and then we would use the name FSR 0 and that would allow us to have the hardware take all 16 bits and use that as the as our indirect address these are what are called indirect address registers and we're not going to really use these uh, we're not going to really use these to indirectly address uh, our memory because it's a little confusing and you don't really have to do that uh, so when we write assembly language we're just going to kind of skip over indirect addressing but when we write C programs the C compiler essentially only uses indirect addressing so it uses these registers extensively and you can use them You're, they're certainly available for an assembly language programmer to use it's just that um, there's no reason to make our lives more complicated than they need to be uh, but if you want to learn about it indirect addressing then uh, then you can play with these registers if you want uh, but normally what we would do is we would we will just we will use the bank select register instead and that's direct addressing and I'll talk about that in a minute finally there's a or almost finally there's a status register here and the status register has a couple of other bits that tell you about uh, the watchdog timer and sleep and we're going to do a lab where we're going to use both of those but for now the only bits in here we really care about are the three status bits the three lower bits bits 0 1 and 2 and they are the 0 bit the half carry bit and the carry bit now the half carry bits a little bit of a throwback and and if you remember in logic design uh, we had a number of times where we talked about binary coded decimal BCD and some of your group projects you had to display BCD numbers in the uh, you know in the uh, seven segment displays but uh, back when we used a lot of BCD before we had enough memory in most of our micro embedded controllers or whatever we would we would do simple math we could do in BCD without it without having to convert it into binary and that that half carry bit was helpful when we did BCD math to uh, to help us because what it does it tells us when we have an overflow from the lower four bits into the upper four bits and you have to adjust it by adding six because remember in BCD math the four bits you only use the first ten you don't use bits uh, 
you don't use bits. Uh, well, you use zero through nine, which is 10. Then the, the bit that would represent the number 10, which would be A, that uh, A, B, C, D, E, and F, we don't use those because uh, it's not part of the decimal system, it's part of hex. And so what we do is we have to adjust that lower nibble and add one to the upper nibble and add six to the lower nibble to get everything to be right. And so the half carry bit would help us with that. We're not going to use BCD, so we're basically going to ignore the half carry bit. But the carry bit, if, if, you, if you add two 8-bit bytes together and you overflow or you subtract and you, and you borrow, that's when that bit gets set. And so that tells us about unsigned math overflows. Now, if we're doing two's complement math, we don't care about the carry bit. We have to, we have to, we have to do another thing, and that is we have to make sure if we do two positives, we don't get a negative, or if we do two negatives, we don't get a positive. As long as we add a positive and a negative, we always are okay, so we don't have to worry about it. But carry outs from from uh, uh, from two's complement math are are fine. They're they're legal and okay, and they don't mean anything overflowed. Uh, so, so we don't really worry about this at all. And the zero bit's helpful because if we have something that's uh, that's zero, then uh, then then this bit will be a one. Otherwise, it will be zero, indicating that it's not zero. Okay. Um, so, the one I haven't really talked about is this bank select register. This uh, this register causes a tremendous amount of confusion to students. And I'll, I'll explain why. So to understand why, you first have to understand a little more about the instruction set. And uh, I don't think I've really put some slides in here to really address this. Um, well, OK, let me just say, the only ones you really need to know about then, the W register, the bank select register, the program counter, which is made up of the PCL, the upper seven bits you can't get to, and the program counter latch high. And then the status register with the three bits of interest and then uh, the watchdog bit and the sleep bit, um, which we'll deal with later. Okay, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about the BSR, but to do that, I wanna, I wanna explain a little bit. Well, let me just say, it, the bank select register is, is used uh, to point to data memory. And the data memory is divided up into banks, 32 banks to be exact. And if you notice, there are five active bits here. These X's mean these bits are not implemented. So this is a five-bit register. So if you look at it, our registers are kind of weird. We've got an eight-bit register here, the W register. We've got an eight-bit status register. We have two eight-bit registers for each of our indirect registers. And then we have an 8-bit register and a 7-bit register put together for the program counter, but sort of separated out as the PCL and the PC latch high. So, so you do have to sort of, and the whole thing is 15 bits, so you have to kind of keep your wits about you here. 8 bits, 5 bits, 8 bits, 16 bits each, 15 bits, with a 8-bit and a 7-bit sort of supporting registers. Okay, so the bank select register points to one of 32 banks. And uh, we're going to look at those banks in just a minute, and you'll see what all the various different banks do. But, uh, but I do want to highlight that. That's what the bank select register does. OK, and I think we yeah, I backed up. All right, so these are the ones you need to know. We're not going to deal with the indirect registers. They're not, they're not, there's nothing secret or crazy about them. It's just that it's, con, it's, it's a little more complication than we need to mess with in, in this course. Um, but if you want to talk to me about them, you're welcome to. I've definitely written assembly language codes that used them. Um, they're not that hard to figure out, but it's, it's just one more little confusion. But um, when, so let me just talk, I, I'm going to, I think I'm going to pull up the data sheet. Yeah, let me, let me just pull up the data sheet. I want to talk about the instruction. I, I, I don't know where that is in my slides. So let me pull up the data sheet. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna shut this down, and I'm gonna go to the data sheet which I have right here, and here's the data sheet. Now, uh, this is this describes the PIC 16F and the LF 1825 or 1829. 
So you have to kind of pay attention because some things apply to the 25 and some things apply to the 29. Uh, there's only difference between the LF and the F is power and some of the uh, electrical features like how much current it can source and things like this and how fast it can go and what voltages it can run at. Uh, so things that you don't have to worry about in the early going. We'll, we'll, we'll get around to talking about that stuff. Uh, but the difference between the 1825 and the 1829 is the 1825 is 14 pins and the 1829 is 20 pins. So they're just more pins. Otherwise, they're pretty much the same. But because of the extra pins, the 29 has some features the 25 doesn't have in terms of how many A to D channels and things like that. Okay, so you can read through, and this tells you a little bit of an overview. Uh, it's a high performance, reduced instruction set CPU, only 49 instructions. Uh, they used to say 49 uh, instructions easy to learn. They took off the easy to learn, so maybe they're hard to learn now. I don't know. Anyway, um, I used to laugh about that. Uh, all of the instructions execute in one cycle except for branches. So if you branch, it, you, it takes one cycle to flush the pipeline, and then and then uh, and then the next uh, cycle you start to execute the, the new instruction. But you have but it's it's pi it's part it's 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 part it's pipelined a little bit, and uh, and so you do have to flush the pipeline. Um, so operating speed, it can run up to 32 megahertz, and it can run all the way down to single-stepped instructions, which means you can execute an instruction in 125 nanoseconds. So when we say you, you can run at 32 megahertz, or 125 nanoseconds per instruction cycle, <coughs> then, uh, well, so you have, to, you have to divide the clock speed by 4 to get the instruction cycle. So, so at 32 megahertz, uh, you divide that by four, and um, that means you're every that means that you're executing eight million instructions a second. Eight million instructions a second. Now keep this in mind. We're we're going to run ours at four megahertz, so we're going to execute a million instructions a second. We don't have to. You can run it at 32 if you want. There's just some there's some timing issues that come into play if you run it flat out and so I I tend not to do that just for that reason but you certainly can you certainly can run it uh, at that higher speed if you want um, and so I I want to go down though and talk about this the, the the memory here in just a minute so let me do that so I'm gonna go I'm gonna use the table of contents I recommend you use the table of contents it's very helpful to jump around I'm gonna go down to memory organization okay and again, remember, we have two different worlds of memory. We have the program memory, which is the flash memory, where the program is stored. And we have the data memory, which also maps all the special function registers for all the peripheral modules. All right, so I'm not going to talk about the program memory right now. Just remember, it's 32K by 14 maximum, but we don't have all that. We've only got 8K. And, uh, and so since we only have 8K, uh, we that 8K is sort of, I think it's just replicated over and over. So if you exceed 8K, you're, you just start over at the beginning. Anyway, uh, but you can only store 8K of uh, program, uh, 8,192 instructions in our program memory. Okay, and um, here's how the program memory is laid out. It, uh, it, it has some hardware, it's got 16 levels of hardware stack. It's got a reset vector, an interrupt vector. The resets vector is at location zero in program memory. The interrupt vector is location four. We'll come back and talk about that. You're gonna do an interrupt lab. I think lab three or four is an interrupt lab, so you're, you'll have to learn about this pretty soon. But uh, we'll come back to it, don't worry. It's no big deal. Uh, all, that is, all that means is if you push the reset button, the program always starts over at zero, zero, zero in your program memory. And if you uh, create an interrupt some way, then your program stop, finishes the instruction it's executing and jumps control over to location four. And hopefully you've got your interrupt service routine located at interrupt four, and hopefully you've got a branch instruction at location zero to jump to the beginning of your main routine. All right, so anyway, um, so, so that's that. Let me scroll on down here, uh, and I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about, well, here's the status register. So here's our Z bit our digit carry bit and our carry bit. Remember, we're going to not really worry about the DC bit much. And then we have those two other bits I mentioned, 
the timeout bit, which has to do with the watchdog timer, which we'll explain and do a lab on that later, and the power down bit, which means there's, there's, there's been a sleep instruction executed. And we'll talk about sleep. We're gonna do a sleep lab, uh, which also uses the watchdog timer. Okay, so here is your data memory. And the difference between the program memory and the data memory is the data memory is only uh, eight, bits, eight bits wide whereas the program memory is 14 bits. So every location is 14 bits in program memory, but in all the data memory and all, essentially almost all, all the control registers for all the modules are basically 8-bit registers. There's a couple where they take two 8-bit registers and put them together, but you still have to address them separately. Um, so every me so there, like I said, there are 32 banks in program memory. And the first 12 bytes in every bank are the programmer's model or the, what they call the core registers. Those are the ones we just looked at. The W register, the BSR, uh, the indirect registers, the program counter latch, the program counter low, uh, the status register, and I think there's an interrupt control register thrown into this mix too that we didn't include in the, in the programmer's model. So there's 12 bytes here of core registers. And they are, they are the same exact registers, they just happen to be mapped in the first 12 bytes in every bank. So even though there's 32 banks and these show up 32 times, you don't have 32 core registers, you've only got 12. And they're all, but they just, but what this means is you don't have to be, you don't have to have the bank select register pointed to the right bank to get to the core registers. You can automatically get to them uh, in every bank. Then you have special function registers and there can be up to 20 bytes of these in every bank. And, uh, and so that brings us up to 32 bytes, which is uh, two zero, so one F hex. So the next byte, which, is, which, which would be byte 32, because we start at zero, remember, are 20 hex. That's the first byte of data of just general purpose uh, random access memory, static RAM. And in the first bank, the upper 16 bytes become what we call common RAM. And just like the core registers, these ups, upper 16 bytes are mapped to every bank. So if you don't want to screw around with uh, changing banks, uh, you can put all your data in these upper 16 bytes. Now, if you need more than 16 bytes, then you're screwed. But, uh, but for the first 16 bytes, you can use this. Um, if you need, then when you go to the next bank, this pattern repeats. So if we go down here and we look at our banks, we can see we have a, a little drawing for every bank. This is bank zero. This is bank one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight through 15, 16 through 23, 24 through 31. That's our 32 banks. And the bank that we're looking at is determined by the BSR, the bank select register, that five bit register with the upper three bits that aren't implemented so you only have five bits, but that's two to the fifth is 32. And so that's our, our, zero to, our bank zero to 31. That's our 32 banks. Now notice in these upper banks, there's nothing in here except these 12 core registers that, are, that show up in every bank with a few exceptions. There's some, there's some, there's some stuff in here uh, in bank 31 uh, that you have to go to table three, seven to look at. And this is some of the stuff that it's kind of weird things uh, and not to really worry about it. Now, if we go back down to the beginning, you'll notice in bank zero and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you have general purpose RAM. Now here you have 96 bytes, but here you have 80 bytes, 80 bytes, 80 bytes, 80 bytes, 80 bytes, 80 bytes, 80 bytes. And we keep going 80 bytes, 80 bytes, 80 bytes, 80 bytes. And in this one, just 48 bytes. And then none. There's no more general purpose RAM after that. Once you get to bank 13, there is no more RAM. So that's our 1K of RAM. And if you add that up, if you add up, uh, and oh, why is this 96 and this is 80? That's because the upper 16 bytes here are the same here and here and here and here and here and here and here. Every upper 16 bytes all the way through, no matter where you are, is still that 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 first upper 16 bytes of RAM. And again, that's so that you wouldn't ever have to 
uh, change your bank select register if you're going to put stuff in that upper uh, 16 bytes. So, so, so we count 80 bytes here plus the upper 16, and then we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So that's 11 times 80 plus 96 plus 48, and that should add up to 1024, 1K of RAM. Okay, and and uh, and so that's that's how that's set up. Now, so that's how we do our RAM, and I'll, I'll explain why this is in just a minute. But it has it has to do with our 14-bit instructions, and it turns out in in our 14-bit instructions that refer to the data RAM or special function registers, there is seven bits of address stored in the instruction, and five bits address in the bank select register to give us our uh, 12 bits of address and if you and if you think about it the 12 bits of address exactly what we need to address 32 128 byte banks and each one of these banks is 128 bytes 0 to 7f but but they're labeled sequentially so the first bank is 0 to 7f this is 80 to ff this is uh, 100 to uh, 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 17f and so forth and notice again we have these these uh, these core registers are across all these uh, the first 12 but then starting on on C that's where that's where we have that's where we begin to get uh, different stuff and if you'll notice in bank 0 starting at at 0 C 0 D 0 E we have port A, port B, port C. That's how you access your peripheral pins. And then we have these peripheral interrupt register 1, peripheral interrupt register 2, 3, and 4. And then you have timer 0, uh, counter register, timer 1, low, timer 1, high, timer 1, control register, timer 1, gate control, and so forth. These, all the way up to 1F, we have these special function registers that basically typically control our various peripheral modules. Uh, here's our oscillator control register. Uh, here we have our D to A register, I don't know, AD con, our AD control registers, and uh, I, don't, our, I don't know where our high and low were. They're somewhere in here probably. Um, I don't know. But anyway, every, every one of our registers uh, for all of our peripheral modules show up somewhere in this special function range from from uh, from uh, once from 0 C all the way up to 1 F and then starting at 2 0 hex all the way up to uh, to uh, 6 F hex are our general purpose RAM and then the common RAM that upper 16 bytes that's mapped to everyone is up here now if you actually need a continuous block of memory that's more than 80 bytes or 96 bytes then what you can do is uh, is you can use indirect addressing and you can address the entire RAM space as one continuous block. Uh, but, but you have to use indirect addressing to do that. You can also use indirect addressing to directly uh, reference program memory and some of the special stuff. So that's really partly why the indirect addressing is there. Um, okay, so we won't probably ever use more than the first few blocks, a few banks of memory, um, but uh, there are some of these uh, some of these control registers we may have to uh, use uh, that are up in some of these upper banks. Probably, you can see by the time we get here, timer 4, uh, peripheral control register 4 for timer 4, timer 4 control, timer 6. Uh, there's also a timer 2. Uh, but there's after that, there are no more special function registers. Uh, there's really nothing after that. So anyhow, so you can see because of that, uh, we will never really go past bank 8 uh, unless you use memory way up here. And once you get past bank 12, there's really nothing you'd, you'd ever use with maybe the exception of bank 31 where there's a few things, but we're not going to use any of those. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's how that's set up. I think now I'm going to stop uh, and I'm going to just do a real quick soldering demo. So I, I'm going to pause this. I'll get that all set up and then we'll do the soldering demo in just a minute. Okay. We're going to continue here. Uh, with the solder demo, I have a former student. This is Nolan Manteuffel. Nolan happens to be a, a master solder uh, person. And uh, so, uh, anyway, um, so 
Uh, I'm going to turn it over to him and he's just going to show you and I want you to pay particular attention to how long it takes to get a good solder connection and uh, what it should look like when it's done. And we've got a nice micro mi uh, mac macroscopic view of it here. Um, so I'll turn it over to Noah. Okay, so the key to soldering is flux, solder, and then the right temperature and the right amount of time. Uh, the flux I'm going to be using is this Kester flux. Uh, there's uh, probably any anything that says flux is going to work well. And don't you don't need to put that much. This comes out kind of fast. There you go. So we got some flux. Uh, just a quick wiki search about why do I need to use flux. We'll answer. We'll answer that question. Um, cut the pins. And then uh, clean the uh, tip. Get some on the tip. Should be good on that one. Clean tip. Boom. And if you can kind of show them when you're all done how it makes that little conical uh, shape around the pin. Yeah, so you want the um, you want the surface finish. Let's see, oh, it's a little out of focus. It's not too bad, but you may have to take it out of the vise and twist the angle just a little bit once you get it all done. Yeah, there you go. So you want the surface finish to be smooth and. Let's see here. Yeah, maybe not as close. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. right there. Yeah, exactly. See the little cone-shaped solder that forms around the pin? It must bond to the pin and bond to the little ring on the board completely. You do not want any holes or defects where it binds to the board because that would indicate you didn't get it hot enough. All right, that's what they should look like. And uh, go ahead and bridge maybe two of them and show what you do to get rid of a bridge if you get a bridge. Yeah, so let's say let's say I put too much solder. Let's say that the um, these two are are um, bridged like this. Um, well, I can just try and heat it up and knock it off. But if you can find some solder braid uh, or wire, do you have solder braid? No. I don't usually use well, it. Well, okay, so... Well, I do. I mean, it's right here. Okay, so um, solder braid is... Um, it's it's just copper that's in a braid. And what you can do is you put the copper on top of the, the solder you want to remove, and then you put your iron on top of the copper. And it uh, when the solder melts, it wicks into the the uh, solder braid. So they also call it solder wick uh, if you can't find it under braid. But um, That's a little example of I added solder. It wasn't where I wanted it. It was too much and I removed it with the wick. Yeah. Show them how to knock it off too and then we'll quit. Um, that's my preferred technique. Oh, okay. So, um, <laughs> it, you can't, there are some things you can't knock. Like if you're soldering on a 300 pound motor you can't pick it up and tap it on the board. So let's say there's way too much solder right there. Uh, I need to get the solder off. So um, I heat it up and then, you know, flick it off or um, knock it off like that. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you, Nolan. All right. Well, that concludes the lecture for today. And with Nolan's help, hopefully you get an idea of what a nice solder joint should look like. We will see you on Friday in the lab. Do that. And